Ready? So today I want to talk about some ecosystem services, let's say services, that are so sometimes overlooked by bigger assessments. And um, just as a guess, uh, what is in the picture? Uh -huh. Very good. So one of the non-timber forest products is medicinal plants. So what else do we get that is non-timber from the forest or from the woodlands or mangroves, similar wooded environments? Yeah? Honey? Honey? Yes? Fruits? Fruits? Edible fruits? What else? Food. Sorry? Food? Food? Yeah? Medicine? Gum arabic. Gum arabic? Gums and resins. What else do we get? Mushrooms. Mushrooms. What else? Fruits. Fruits that are edible as well. What Shelter else? Shelter from war. Shelter? What else? Edible insects. Edible insects like caterpillars. Good. What else? Leaves. Leaves? For manure. For manure, yeah. What else? Construction. Ah, I was thinking, eh? People make houses, eh? They don't go to town to buy it. And how do we cook? Firewood. Firewood and? Charcoal. And charcoal. So non-timber forest products are everything except timber. It's pretty straightforward. So I put a list. This uh, is the C4 definition, so we get construction materials. We also have bamboo, rattans, sometimes used to make the roofs of the houses of people that cannot afford tin, for example. We also get fish and game. We forgot about bushmeat. This is a big thing in some parts of Africa. We also get um, yeah, medicine, we said, re resins, and it also brings money to people. And I think this is very important to think about that because many of these products are not just used at the household level. They're also used to make money, to pay school fees for children, to pay medicine, to pay other things that we need to get. So uh, I want to point out, especially in times of famine, like when there's a big drought, people turn to the forest. When the crops fail, they go and harvest these wild tubers or the wild leaves or the wild fruits. So the fact that they're very important in these crucial times where life and death, the line between them is thin, then make these non-timber forest products very important. And I want to also raise the point that it's been an increasing interest in the conservation and development world, the big NGOs and even governments, to investigate these non-timber forest products because often they're overlooked. We don't even know which ones are there, how much money they mean. And I'm going to present a few examples and I hope by the end of the morning you will realize that this is big money. So we need to know how much is out there, which species, how are they harvested, is this sustainable, and how they really contribute to the local livelihoods or even to the national income of a country. So let's start from the very beginning. Oh, just a quick example. This is the Eastern Iron Mountains in Tanzania. And uh, there was a study done in 2014 that showed that the value of charcoal, firewood, poles, and thatch that is the ones that to make the roof of houses, was estimated at 42 million per year, just from the forest in these mountains. So it might be an important ecosystem service in the places that we work. But I don't want to talk about charcoal and firewood. I want to talk today about medicinal plants, because this is something I have a very special interest in. So I guess we all know what are medicinal plants. They're medicinal plants, so they're plants they use for medicine. And there are about 6,000 in Africa that we know, probably more. So why do people use medicinal plants? To cure diseases. Yeah, but why, why they don't just go to the pharmacy? Uh -huh. Maybe because they are poor. So Be because Pharmacy is yes. expensive. expensive. Good point. What else? Because they believe it works better. Important. What else? Mm -hmm. So they trust it's more effective. Eh? What else? Some believe they don't have side effects. Uh huh. So they don't have side effects. In some cases, yes. 
they are more accessible. In some parts of Africa, we actually don't have pharmacies. Even if I have the money to buy it, when I work in the middle of the rainforest, I cannot go anywhere to buy. Yeah? Something else? So there's several reasons why people use medicinal plants. They're cheaper, they're more effective, or people believe so. There's no access. And there's also uh, this belief that for some diseases, Western medicine doesn't work. And as many of you may know, this is the case of aphrodisiac. So a lot of African men use. <laughs> Not just because they're cheaper, they're just more effective. So, and we don't go it, want to go into details, eh, but we all know that is the case. But I mean, just to remember eh, that a lot, I would say most, not to say all compounds that we get in the products that we can buy in a pharmacy, most of them actually come from medicinal plants anyway. So that's why they're really important. And just to get a little bit on the economic value of this. So in Ghana, a study done showed that the medicinal plant trade, so those that you can find in markets and not those that people just use at home, those that you can actually assess in the markets in the big urban areas, was $7.8 million a year. And in Gabon, it was 1.5. And I really, I mean, I know in Gabon it's smaller, but if you think that the population of Gabon is about 1 million, it makes it even more. And you know, Gabon is a developed, or quite developed country. Eh? The problem of access to pharmacies is not really an issue there. So it's just to show how other factors like beliefs that they're more effective or they're better for certain time of diseases, it's important. So medicinal plants are an important ecosystem services. And um, they provide income for communities that get involved in the trade. So one of the studies that um, I'm interested in and I've been working on is how can we help the local communities living at the edge of protected areas get involved in this trade. So maybe this is not a carbon project, eh? this is just trying to sustainably harvest some of these medicinal plants so they can get an income. But let's go a little bit of an overview. So the first thing, if we want to see, we want to promote these ecosystem services in our protected area or in our area of study, the first thing we need to know is what is harvest. Are we talking about a small liana, a herb or a tree? And then which part is harvested? Because if we pick the fruits from the floor, it's kind of okay -ish. If we have to uproot the plant to use the roots, then it's not so sustainable. Then also is the quantity. How often do they get harvest? So this is a big issue, especially for bark of trees. If they only harvest once a year, a little bit of the bark might be okay. If you completely remove the whole bark of the tree very often, the tree is going to die. So the how often things are harvested and how much is also important. Number four, how much is out there? If we're only harvesting a tree that is uh, like one stem per hectare, might not be so sustainable. Eh? If it's a tree that is so much all over the place, then maybe it's okay because some might die, but the others will continue to sustain the population. I'll provide the slides, uh, Jess, so don't worry. I haven't yesterday, but I will today, promise. <laughs> then another one is about the habitat. So especially in old growth forest, these are small trees that I showed you yesterday. They live in the shade and they live there forever and they grow very slowly. They're, most uh, they're more likely to be over harvested than maybe a tree that you can have in your farm that you can easily plant and it's okay to be in the sun. And so it depends on the habitat where the plant is found. Another point to consider, especially as you, the decision makers for this area, is if the plant is already considered endangered. So I put the website of the IUCN red list that I guess all of you know about. And you'll be surprised. Sometimes they're things that are traded and we even use them commonly and actually they're in the red list. So always remember to check because it might be out there. Then we cannot promote something that is already listed as endangered. Eh? It would not look very professional on us. So I think I already said that it depends on the trunk. And oh, just a one point. So sometimes people think that, oh, if we just collect the leaves of the tree, it's okay. Or just a little bit of a bark. I mean, I work with trees, eh? but it would apply with other systems. The problem eh, is that if some plants, we remove too many leaves, the tree or the plant will stop fruiting. So it also have an effect on the long term in the population. Eh? So we need to really think about everything. And also remember that as things get valued and become 
more in demand, people usually start cultivating them. Because why would you walk for kilometers looking around in the forest to find something if you can just have it in your garden? So these that I said that you need to consider is when the things are found in the wild. But of course, if they're cultivating in the garden, then it's OK. So just a couple of examples. This is the study done in Gapon, the one I mentioned before. So they surve surveyed 21 market stalls. You need the little lady sitting in the little shop that I showed the picture in the beginning, in eight cities in Gapon. And they found 217 species traded. This is not what people collect in the house. This is actually what people sell eh? and urban people go and buy because they don't have the time to go to the forest themselves. And they show that it, the main uses of these plants was for rituals, you know, to get your girlfriend to fall in love with you and things like that. <laughs> also for woman health. So this is a big thing for medicinal plants. Some of the health problems of women, maybe they don't feel so confident to go and see a doctor especially when the doctor in many countries is a male, you know, there's some cultural, so they rather go and see one of the medicinal, traditional healers that is a lady. So this is something important to consider as well. And the other one was about childcare. And I was quite surprised when I saw this study because my research on medicinal plants, malaria always comes top three. And I was like, oh, I've been to Gabon. There's malaria there, what happens? And then I realized that in Gabon, the government subsidized malaria treatment. So of course, if you get malaria treatment for free in the pharmacy, you're not going to bother go, going to the market, is it? So that is in Gabon. So just to show that in a country that is pretty rich, medicinal plants are still very important. And um, yeah, the plant parts uh, used, so it was mostly entire plants and bark. So when we think about the sustainability, obviously entire plant is not very sustainable if we harvest everything. We might need to assess how much is out there or if it's cultivated. And for the bark, it depends how much bark in the tree you're harvesting. And one of the top species used is the Okumea kleiniana, <coughs> the tree that you saw in the Monadamonian forest that, of the exercise yesterday, is a timber tree. So just as you start thinking about this, so of course, when you have trees that are used for timber, then it might get into a conflict with the local communities that want to use it for medicine. Because if they harvest all the trees for timber, it's a lot of money, then the value they might get for the little medicine becomes less. So it's always hard when something is used for timber. So another example, this time for Sierra Leone. I told you I was also living there for a while. So in this study of a colleague of mine, they serve, uh, he surveyed three cities in Sierra Leone, the three main cities. Eh? And he found 43 species traded in these markets. And as you see, the main use was malaria. Malaria treatment is not subsidized in Sierra Leone. Worms and body pain, cough and cold. So we can see that the prevalence. So here, people use medicinal plants for everything, not just for woman health and stuff like that. You see here is really for general, uh, more common um, diseases. Then in this case, the, par the plant parks trade more often where leaves and bark. So okay, here, whole plants were not that common. And then we also looked at which uh, endangered species were there, and we saw three that were traded very common and actually endangered. One of them, Garcinia cola, actually exported to the neighboring countries. So, but in this case, a study was done to try to see if we could involve the local communities in the forest reserve that I was working in this trade. Can they sustainably harvest and can this be an alternative source of income? Eh? So here we are not thinking giving them goats or teaching them how to do agroforestry. We actually thought about how can we valorize the forest they already have? Because if they sustainably harvest this medicinal plant, we can have a carbon project, but at the same time they can get a little bit extra money by being involved in the trade. So we saw that 22% of the species were only found in the primary forest and about 30% were sustainably harvested. So there was an opportunity to try to organize this uh, to help them get some income from the trade. And I, and I really like this paper. This is a study done in Brussels. And uh, as you may think, in Brussels, there's a lot of access to Western medicine. Eh? Pharmacies all over the corner. Actually there, what it's hard is to find the local market with the medicinal plants, the herbs.
and actually people still use it. They did this study recently and they found 83 species traded. You see the species in the kola nut, shibata, aloha, mondia, witi, and mostly used for woman health and as aphrodisiac. So even in a country where people have money and there's a good access to Western medicine, people still prefer to use herbal medicine for certain issues. And we can already see it's the same issues we mentioned before, aphrodisiac and woman health. And also some have double uses. Yeah? So remember that some of these medicinal plants can also be used just as food. So I just wanted to present the World Agroforestry Center. So this is a center that it's, I think the main office is in Nairobi and they have satellite offices and I don't know, in Cameroon, they just opened one in Sierra Leone and Madagascar. So, and they do a lot of research on non-timber forest products. So with regard to medicinal trees, they're focusing on three species that I'm going to present that. And the idea that the World Health Forestry Center has is that if we can help choose the best genetic material, so the best trees, maybe the trees that have the biggest fruits or that produce more bark or that actually the bark has the highest compound that we are using for our medicinal treatment, then we can not just grow them from seed, but we could also graft them so we maintain these genetic properties that we're interested in. But as you can imagine, eh, you know, how many years it took for mango to become domesticated? So it's, uh, the domestication process is uh, slow, it requires a lot of research, and they're still working towards that. So it's just as I wanted to show, and I, I mean, what's being done as well. So first tree, Prunus africana. I guess many of you in the room will know it, the African cherry. It's found in the mountains from Cameroon to here, the Albertine Reefs and East Africa. It's probably the most famous of the medicinal plants traded and come internationally coming from Africa. It's actually vulnerable. So it's endanger not in danger, but it's cited in the IUCN red list. So the trade of this plant is regulated. It's mostly used to treat the, a type of prostate cancer and the numbers of this trade are incredible. It becomes even <laughs> important, I mean, <laughs> It plays a role in international politics in Africa, I'm not joking, it's really big. And it's becoming very rare in East Africa where the tr international trade started. And this is a figure that I really like from Cameroon, a recent study as well. It shows the export, how it changed over time, eh? I mean from the 1975. About 800 tons of bark is exported from Cameroon annually. And I can tell you in Cameroon, this tree can only be found in a few mountains. Mon Cameroon, Mon Oku, Mon Bam, uh, Rumfi Hills. It's not that widespread. So just imagine how many trees are being debarked every year to be able to supply this internationally. Not to mention how much stays at home because people also use it at home for their own things. And um, we can see that this is a, a species, as I said, that it's considered vulnerable. So the trade of this species is regulated. And it's very interesting to see how, uh, for example, here in 2014, the, they reduced the number, the quota, how much Kenya, Burundi and Madagascar were allowed to export because it's more in danger in the country. There's fewer stems of these species left. For Cameroon, it was good news eh? because the demand in the Western world is the same. So if you are, are allowed to sell less, me, I can sell more. So I make more money. So it's just to give an idea of how medicinal plants not just play a role at the local level for the local people. Actually, it's important for the economy of some countries. So what is CTS? For those that you may not know, so this is the Conven Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Fauna and Flora. So it's an agreement to try to help stop these endangered species from disappearing. And it has two appendix. Appendix one is the one that all trade is illegal. This would be the case of elephant. Although it happens, eh? but it's illegal in theory. And then the second appendix, appendix two, is the trade is regulated and this would be the case of Prunus africana. So the quota is set based on how many trees you have, the density, how much you exported the last year or the previous year, what are the other countries allowed to export. So Prunus would be in this later one. And I think it's also important when you check for your species if it's in danger or not. After you check if it's the species you are looking at, after you check if it's in danger, go and check if the trade is regulated or not. Because you would also be surprised that for many species it's regulated. For example, for orchids. All the orchids are also in the CTS. 
So another example of an important medicinal plant is the Yohimbe the Demare. It's mostly found in the rainforest from Nigeria to Angola. And uh, as, just as a hint, because my colleagues were asking, it's not found in Cameroon, uh, sorry, in the Congo, sorry guys. And this is called African Viagra. I know somebody who spent two weeks high on because of this. So dosage is very important. So just to have an idea, about 800 tons are also exported from Cameroon every year with a value of 600,000. So big numbers again. Eh? And the World Agroforestry Center is the WAC, WAC that I wrote in the bottom, is also trying to cultivate. Because you see, super male, there's a great demand for this product. So they're turning it into more commercialized product. Next one, Anikia chloranta. Some of you might know the tree. There's another one called Anikia polycarpa. I think that's the one in Congo. It's yellow. It's astonishing yellow, the bark. It also has, uh, it's also used for aphrodis as aphrodisiac, but it also has antibiotic properties. Some of the local use is also against malaria. Uh, this one is not exported in terms of timber, it's more mostly used at the local level, and the Wall Agroforestry Center is also trying to cultivate it because this tree is probably found between one stem per hectare or less than one. So it's quite rare in the rainforest, even where is it found. The same was actually for the one, the previous, I forgot to say the same thing, eh? less than one stem per hectare. So to try to sell it in bigger numbers, imagine, eh? to get, try to get 800 tons, you need to walk the whole forest. So when we think, okay, medicinal plants are important in my study area. So how I'm going to investigate if the trade is sustainable or how much is out there, or do I want to promote it as an alternative livelihood for the local communities? So I think there's three main points that one we need, we need to consider. The first one is about what is out there. So maybe we can do a market survey, go to the markets and see what is being sold. We can talk to the traditional healers. In some countries they're organized in societies. So you can go to this, their register and you go and talk to them. You can also talk to the local people at the local level, to their houses, what are you usually buying, how much it costs, how often do you use it. And you can also use to I mean, study companies. So for example, there was a recent study done in Kenya and it was a, about 50 something companies that make herbal medicine just in nice little packages. But it's not Western medicine, it's just still herbal. They just put like these little bags of tea, of dry bark, of roots. So in some countries it's a little bit more moved on. Of course, if we want to uh, know if this is sustainable, we also need to look at the the ecology of these plants, which pla parts of the plants are traded, is the species regenerating, are people cultivating them or not, and then uh, the compounds. So if we think more into the future, could we get maybe more money out of it eventually? So we also need to think about the studying the um, chemistry of these plants. So just to have a few ideas of what is out there, this is a study done in Burundi, so just next door. They interview 60 traditional healers near the capital. And what did they found? 155 species used for medicine. You have the list of the most important there and uh, the most common diseases. You can see it's mostly diarrhea, skin rash and ringworm. So quite common uh, diseases. And then um, interestingly they found that three plants that were commonly used by the healers when they looked online or in the literature, nobody had investigated their uh, active compounds. So this is the, the way as well that sometimes when we do one of these more ethnobotanical surveys, we realize that maybe there's a potential for a new compound to be discovered and used maybe for antibiotic resistance bacteria. Of course, it's very important to remember that when a pharmaceutical company discovers a new active compound and can make a lot of money out of it. Something needs to be given back to the communities that used this medicinal plant for a long time. And this is tricky because sometimes part of the research is not well documented. The benefit sharing might get at the higher level and not really to the poorer people of certain tribe that was the one who really used this before. But I, I want to make a point that sometimes uh, people think that developing a new medicine is easy and it is not. It requires a lot of money and a lot of time. So even a pharmaceutical company, one day want to develop a new product, they need to investigate which is the active compound, in which dose, 
What are the side effects? Because although people believe that herbal medicine has fewer side effects, it still has some. So we need to know which ones. And also what is the safe dose for adults, for pregnant women, for children. So it requires a lot of experiments. So it takes time to develop a new medicine. So now we go to what else do we need to know is how the plant is being... Yes? Uh, 